I have a lot of paper materials that I need to organize here, partly because I have been inspired this morning to add some notes. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, which has helped me uh, think about how repetitive my writing tends to be. <laughs> um, I'm very happy to be here and very um, honoured to be speaking to you this morning um, and at the, at the invitation of my good friend Jack Cho, who I have uh, not seen often enough in recent years. And so I was very delighted to be invited to Hong Kong in order to correct that <laughs> and to be with you all today. Um, it's, it's a wonderful place, Hong Kong. I have never seen thunder and lightning like I did at 1.30 this morning. Um, so I currently live in Portland, Oregon, where the reputation of this city is that it's one of the wettest cities in the United States. But there was nothing <laughs> that Portland has thrown at me yet to compare to last night's um, explosive uh, performance. I, that will be a memory that I take with me from Hong Kong. Um, it's, it's a very exciting place to be at this time of year. Um, so I wanted to um, begin with um, some thoughts prompted by um, the introductory um, opening ceremony. Um, I feel a responsibility, really, to account for my methods in this talk. Um, as Richard mentioned, I will be giving you some of the uh, historical research behind my new book, Counterproductive, which takes um, the decisions about methodologies very seriously. Uh, I was trained in a field called cultural studies, which is an interdisciplinary field. It has not been running for as long as other disciplines in the university. Um, but it does seem to be uh, old enough to um, compare with um, the age of this university um, from what I learnt this morning. So um, cultural studies began depending on your arguments uh, in the 50s and 60s, particularly in the UK, this is the tradition that I inherited. And one of the things that we do in cultural studies is we study what's popular, what's mainstream and what's ordinary. So the things that we take as worthy of scholarly analysis are often things that you find in everyday life, in popular culture, in the media. And what I've done in my recent work looking at the history of productivity is apply this method and this training to some unconventional objects. And I wanted to start with one of those by way of introduction today. The picture you see here is taken from a self-help book called Time Locked. And it is characteristic of the genre of productivity self-help literature where you are asked to account for yourself by way of a quiz as a way of getting to know how big your problems really are. <laughs> um, and one of the things that I do as a cultural studies trained ethnographer is that I often try and immerse myself in the object that I'm studying to try and see it from the point of view of the reader or the person that the text is addressing. So I have done a lot of these quizzes over the last few years, and we can talk a little bit about um, why they have been helpful, <laughs> um, why they've been helpful in coping with uh, a completely new work environment. As you just heard, I changed jobs over the last few years and also changed countries. And so doing these quizzes has been a way for me to come to terms with uh, my own feelings of stress <laughs> and also my own ambitions to be a productive worker in a whole new environment. But the thing that's funny about this quiz, you may not be able to see, but I have circled my answers <laughs> in the questions. Um, and the questions range from during a typical weekend, what do you currently engage in most regularly? According to uh, the academics here this morning, we engage in work <laughs> and conferencing on Sundays. Um, but there are questions to do with uh, how many vacations do you take? How do you feel when you're on vacation? How often do you feel rushed on an ordinary day? Um, and during the past year, <laughs> the last question, would you say that your life has grown busier, <laughs> about the same, somewhat less busy, 
or a lot less busy. That was the one that I got number one on because obviously I had uh, a lot of change in my life over, over the year I was reading this book. But I was a little shocked to find that the outcome of my analysis was that I was not time locked at all, <laughs> according to the quiz. I actually had time on my hands. So by doing this quiz, it became apparent to me that according to the measurements and the, the sorts of data that were counted as meaningful in this quiz, I was not busy at all. I should not be stressed. I should somehow feel a little better about my life um, as a result of doing this process of self-audit. Um, I wanted to begin with this example because I think that one of the things that this uh, event is designed to talk about are the ways that we create knowledge and science, um, methods of capture. The premise of digital methods is that we are in need of a new science. I think a new science needs new methods. And there's something about the digital that has made people feel that a new method is necessary, or new methods are necessary to meet a new character of information capture. Um, the, the content of my talk is going to be about how this has been a common feeling in different moments of media introduction over the years. Um, that new media allow us to see the world differently and allow us to account for ourselves differently. Um, so sometimes that is going to be in the form of a survey that's written. Sometimes that's going to be in the form of uh, cinema or photography, which will be another example I use. Um, and increasingly, it will be through the screen, the screens that you all have open <laughs> or are secretly checking while I'm, while I'm talking. But there are only certain forms of human experience that any medium can capture, any technology can capture. So one of the things I think that runs throughout my work is an enduring question about what forms of meaning and value and human activity and experience escape measure. So that's really one of the ways that we can talk about the idea of affect, affect and emotion and feeling. It's very hard to use any kind of technology to capture that in quite the way that it feels um, when, you're, when you're a person um, who feels intimately um, different forms of stimulus and response. So in the talk today, what I want to do is give you a little bit of insight on these different histories, different moments when methods were being renewed or invented or performed to show a new kind of science and a new way of understanding information capture and how it could create new forms of authority that have consequences for us today. Um, if, if digital methods is, is one of the things that we're learning to study in this summit and in this, in this week that's coming, um, the best analogy I can make for the material I'm talking about today is that um, at the turn of the century, last century, there was a similar moment of invention for methodologies, and that moment was scientific management. A lot of my examples are going to be coming from that um, initial moment. But I wanted to begin with something that some of you might remember if you've seen some of my work in the past. Um, I mentioned um, that I was an ethnographer um, and that part of my research before I joined Intel was to study knowledge workers and how they use technology. Um, how the changing use of technology in the workplace was having effects on people in their home life. Um, so I'm originally from Australia and for my postdoctoral research I did a study of knowledge workers in Brisbane, Australia, also a place that has wonderful thunderstorms. <laughs> um, but this photo is taken from one of the subjects of that study, a woman who uh, in the course of the three years we studied her and met her and got to know her had twin boys. And one of the things that changed about her life as a result of this uh, life event was that she had to change her schedule. And this quote, where she talks about getting up at half past six in the morning to do her email before she goes to work, was for me a very uh, key insight from the study. She had a way of talking about 
doing her email here in this quote, saying that she wanted to do it before she got to her actual workplace, where she would be ready to do work. And of course, that inverted comma here means that work at the office was where she started to count <laughs> when she was actually working. But the work that she did in the home, she wasn't counting as work, as labor. Um, and to me, this was a really important distinction that she was making between the things that she had to do to prepare for work and the place that she did that, and then the things that she was telling herself um, in order to justify this form of scheduling and the kind of efficiency that she saw in this behavior, which to me um, was not always positive behavior, right? So this was one of the key stories from Works Intimacy that people move their work around. <laughs> then they move their work around um, the people they love, the obligations they feel, but also in ways that make them feel more productive. Um, they manage their time and they manage their schedule according to the demands of them in a social context. And after I wrote this book, I was curious, how did we get to this point where we have professional women getting up early at the crack of dawn to avoid their children so that they can read their email? which is you know, not an uncommon story um, that this book was telling. So I decided as a good scholar that I would turn to history and find out how new is this practice really. So the new book on productivity turns to some very old archival documents to find out just how new the phenomenon of working from home really is. Um, so in this next picture, what you're seeing is a screenshot of a book called The New Housekeeping, which was written by a woman called Christine Frederick who in the United States. Not many people know about Christine Frederick, I don't think. Um, certainly in my generation, I did have to study some home economics. My mother was actually a home economics teacher in the school that I started um, my education. But she was one of the pioneers of, of home economics, or what's also known as domestic science. And in this image, you're seeing a snapshot of a number of tasks that take place in the home for women at this time in history, and the amount of time required for certain tasks. So you have a baby's bath should take 15 minutes, making bread should take 12 minutes, mixing a cake, should take 10 minutes, icing a cake should take five minutes. And there are a number of ways that um, the items in this woman's household schedule are listed and then given an optimum amount of time to complete. Part of what I do in this research is try and show that the home has always been a site for labor, particularly for women, right? But at the same time, um, it's a reading of history and the practice of time management that questions why it was only paid labor in the office or the factory that was recognized as the origin of scientific management. Looking at these texts that were turn of the century publications in the United States, you see that household engineering, as is the title of Frederick's second book, household engineering was happening at just the same time that scientific management and human factors engineering was entering the formal workplace um, with the authority of science, right? With the authority of men with degrees and, and proximity to cultural institutions which could give that form of measurement more clout and more rigor and more recognition. So one of the things that I like to uh, point to in, in turning to history is the sort of co constant question that we should have about who decides what is the right method, um, what is the right context for that method to be applied, and what gets left out. So in this first chapter of the book, I show that scientific management was happening in just as much um, pattern and rigor and, and uh, I think popularity, um, but because the address for these texts was for popular audiences and for women, they were not held to have the same amount of authority and they were not 
kept in the historical record um, with as much uh, sympathy. So that's the first part of the book. I now want to turn to a couple of those moments where the scientific methods of capture and, and information um, recording became formalised and, and given um, the, the science and uh, recognition that we now attribute to scientific management. And one of the ways that I do this is to um, introduce some new participants to the traditional story of time management. And this is an image that you may not be able to interpret without some help. So um, I wanted to show this as a way of introducing two of the main figures that I focus on in this work um, who are working at around the same time as Frederick Taylor. So you may have heard of Frederick Taylor and hear the story of scientific management being about uh, his methods of timing workers and how fast they can get a task done. And that's certainly what you see in those household manuals where women are encouraged to ice the cake in five minutes. But Frank and Lillian Gilbreth were working at the same time as this um, Taylor uh, tradition was being established. And they were a married couple. They're also known in the United States and possibly further afield for being the couple in the story Cheaper by the Dozen. Cheaper by the Dozen is now a, a film based on a memoir written by the children of this married couple. And they, they had 12 children, <laughs> and a lot of their techniques of time management were also practiced in the home, because as you can imagine, raising 12 children is um, a very difficult thing to do at the best of times. They would use a lot of the techniques of scientific management that they were proposing in the workplace to train their children to be more efficient and to help each other out. Um, and to, uh, to work in a form of um, communal practice, I think, that, um, that is surprising to us today. But this image from uh, their archive of recorded images is actually a picture showing a worker performing a task with light globes on their finger, fingertips. Okay, and this is uh, an innovation called the stereochronocyclograph, not very easy to say that word, trust me. And one of the things that they were very um, determined to do as scientists of productivity was to show a trace of work through all of the forms of technology available at the time. They were the innovators who brought photography to time and motion study. So the motion in time and motion study um, came from their use of new media technologies. And one of the things that is significant about this, and I want to show you an example using um, some archival footage that is now available thanks to the digital methods um, that you're here to talk about, is that uh, their innovations were a way of capturing labour in a way that had not been possible before. And I want to show you some examples of this to highlight how this moment in history was an important way for people to start to see themselves in a new light. So here I have a video, which I'll just need to click on and show you. And it's a silent video, which is always an advantage <laughs> when you're speaking in an unknown auditorium. <coughs> this is one of the many videos um, that are available in the archives online. You can check them out yourself. Uh, but that the Gilbreths produced as a way of showing their trade, the, the forms of efficiency that they could promote for managers in companies um, who were trying to make the work of their uh, employees more um, efficient and productive. This is uh, one, one of the favorite videos I've found in the archive of how Gilbreth trained a lady to be a champion typist. So let's just look at this for a minute.
this is where I'll end it, but it's a very important image I want you to keep in mind because of the grid, but I will come to this. So Frank and Lillian Gilbreth um, were most famous for reforming the bricklayer's stoop. So if, if, if you can think about what it's like to be on a work site and reach down to get a brick and put the next brick on a wall and layer it, they had the insight of actually providing a scaffold for the worker so that there was a, a place for the bricks to be piled so that you eliminated the stoop, <laughs> the bending down. And it was reforms like that that became very famous um, and attractive to managers who were seeking ways to make workers more efficient and also to, to solve the forms of fatigue, um, you know, and, and what's now called ergonomics in the work environment. And um, given our, our current environment of work, um, typically on a keyboard, <laughs> I thought this was a good example for us to unpack because it was also in the office setting that the Gilbreths had um, their reforms adopted. So they would do a lot of manufacturing consultancy, looking at things like pear washing or soap packing or labeling of produce. But they would also do these forms of industrial public relations films that would um, show the applicability of this method across uh, different fields. So part of what they're doing in these uh, films is to show you the way that you can measure more accurately the very small, minute movements of things like a typist finger in order to reform those movements and make them more efficient um, by reducing the amount of movement. So the reason that there is a close-up of the eyes um, the long close-up that you see of the typist's face in that video is that there's a way in which the reform that they are providing on the keyboard and making a new keyboard reduces the amount of times she has to move her head. And I think what's really interesting about this moment in history now, looking back, is that we only really uh, know that form of photography as the close-up now. <laughs> As, as a convention from Hollywood cinema where we learn intimacy and we learn how to identify with the performer on the screen. And what the Gilbreths argued, and Lillian Gilbreth was the, um, was the person who was doing most of the writing of the pair, but because she was a woman, she wasn't able to publish the writing in her own name. She made the argument that uh, workers performing for the camera were like actors performing for the first films. They wanted to have their performance recorded for history so that they could point to their output and the ways in which they improved themselves um, through reflecting on the labor that they had reformed. So if you think about it, um, it's only for us quite natural to see ourselves on screen and to be able to make ourselves appear better <laughs> because we know we're going to be watched um, when that record is disseminated. But for the Gilbreths, um, what was very, I, I suppose, I iconic about their uh, interpretation was that they saw in the worker a desire to be captured as a personality through these new forms of recording devices. Um, and playing on that desire and that interest to be a star of the show <laughs> that is your work um, was one way that they could say to managers who are employing them, um, we will be able to make your workers want to work faster as individuals, as, as members of uh, a workplace that is starting to reward people based on their individual output as opposed to the, the output of a team. So this was a time as well, if you can think back, um, when the collective traditions of labor struggle were very much a threat to management. And so these techniques of turning the worker into an individual star performer <laughs> through things like uh, the cinematic devices capturing their work was a very helpful way to break up that power dynamic where the workers collectively had been in charge of having their, their, their time and their output judged according to productivity measures um, that management's uh, negotiating with them as a collective to these different forms of output that are very much individualised. And, and that is, to me, one of the things that um, we rarely discuss uh, cumulatively, how this process happened over, over the course of several decades.
of individualising productivity performance. Okay, so that was my first big example of how a technology can change the way we think about managing our work and our time. The second one I wanted to show you is another famous study, um, thank you, that is taken from uh, a study known as the Hawthorne study. This was uh, a very famous social science um, program that took place in an American um, manufacturing and assembly plant for AT&T, what's now called AT&T. So telephone assembly um, was the work that, that these women were engaged in, all the wires that were going into telephones and the switches and plugs and cables. Um, so a different moment of digital uh, labour, because the digital labour here, of course, is women's fingers <laughs> assembling coils and winding and so forth. And the point of this study was really to find out what would motivate workers to work more quickly um, and what conditions could be changed in the workplace to uh, encourage them to own that stimulus, that um, that competitive dimension to time management and being a more productive worker. And uh, this study is uh, known for being a, almost a placebo study. Um, in the long reach of history, we realised that by removing these women from the larger factory floor and paying attention to them, um, it, it tended to change the way they approach their work anyway, regardless of what actual conditions um, were given to them. But they were also given a range of incentives like, I don't know, a lunch break <laughs> and um, a range of uh, privileges that were not common at the time. Um, but what I find really fascinating about this um, moment of measurement uh, is that of the original women who were selected from this study, two of the women were kicked out of the study for uncooperative behaviour. Um, the women who were removed from the study were deemed too talkative and uncooperative, um, particularly when it came to uh, participating in the compulsory medical surveillance um, involved in this study. So the women were taken off-site to go to see doctors, to have all kinds of physical um, tests done on them, and there were records taken of all of their physical appearance uh, and a range of judgments that were being made that were very subjective um, to do with their footwear, the way they wore their hair, um, whether their period or menstruation was affecting their output. So very invasive by today's standards, um, but yet one of the most foundational studies of productivity. Um, so this became the basis for what's now called human relations theory, where you start to adjust the conditions based on treating the worker as an individual who needs special attention and needs to be heard in the workplace. But as you can see, there are missing parts of the study where workers are actually replaced for those who are being more productive. Um, and it's not coincidental that this study was taking place at a time when uh, the depression was starting to take hold, so the ways in which the financial motivations um, for these workers, who were all um, first-generation migrants, who were the breadwinners for their families, even though they were uh, just teenage girls, um, a lot of these social aspects are not really reflected in the records that we have um, in the official scientific accounts of time management. So that's one of the um, key examples in the book. I've been told that I don't have very much time left, so um, could I get confirmation on that? Okay, okay. <laughs> I mean, he's the boss as far as I'm concerned, so I'm gonna listen to him. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. I wanna shift now to things that I think you're more interested in, right? Because that was me having my nerd in the archive moment of showing you <laughs> some of the history behind the productivity theories that I'm um, studying from a digital point of view. So fast forward a hundred years <laughs> and now we have a keyboard that learns from you. So you remember the grid of the typist who we saw in the original Gilbreth video who reformed her keyboard movements having been watched by the expert management, management consultants. Now we have technologies that will provide this surveillance for you. Um, so how many people have 
swift key on their phone. Anybody? Oh, Jack. I did not arrange that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> swift key is a tool that you can download onto your app that will learn the common mistakes that you make when you're typing really quickly and you're trying to walk at the same time or multitask or whatever it is that you're trying to do in the interests of being more productive. The other thing that SwiftKey does, I would show you the video, but I don't have time. It shows you the trace of your finger across the keyboard layout, just like the Gilbreths did when they put the light globes on the fingers of the early um, participants in their studies. And this way of representing speed through light, through whizzing through the keyboard, is an extension of these early moments in management thinking, where being able to visualise the trace of your movement and your tasks uh, encourages a sensitivity to times and its optimization, right? And so that's the thing that I think both of these moments in history that I showed you have in common. They have this moment of being able to show you how you are doing <laughs> and how you could be doing better with the adoption of efficiency ideas. Another similar uh, process is in apps that are available for download onto, onto your uh, laptop or your computer where the purpose of the program is to show you what you are spending your time doing. So rescue time is an example of this where it will count the amount of minutes you're spending on Facebook per day you know, relative to your email or relative to your assignment that you're working on or whatever you should be doing, and it will quantify that for you, right? And see how, you know, in red, the negative things that you're doing are coded as distraction, and in blue, the things that are positive are productivity. So, uh, again, by the application of this new digital technology, you are able to see yourself in a new way in order to optimise your time. Some of the productivity apps that I analyse in this work are quite stunning <laughs> in their rigour, you know, in enforcing a discipline to how you approach your device. So vitamin C, I think is the top one, allows you to eliminate distractions entirely, just like cold turkey. It allows you to pre-program what websites you are allowed to go to or not. <laughs> And it will stop you. I mean, it will literally put a block on things that you decide are a waste of your time and that are distracting you from the things that you really want to get done. You know? And so the ways that these technologies are helping you become the better version of yourself <laughs> that you think that you're capable of when you're, being, um, when you're being ambitious about what your output is going to be at the start of a day. They try and trick you. Um, into thinking that you can always be the same version of yourself, you know, the productive version, as opposed to the more social version or um, the not very productive version, which I can sometimes uh, identify with. So my project was really looking at the way that these tools inherit ideas of efficiency from these much earlier moments in management thinking. Um, and one of the focuses I have in this work is the way that there is a way of organising work through these technologies um, that, as I earlier said, individualises the workload in a way that's interesting. Um, but at the same time, it rearranges work to make it seem more compelling, even if the work may not itself be interesting. Um, these two examples are list-making tools that allow you to arrange your life in the right order. <laughs> Again, perhaps at the start of the day when, you've, when you think that you're going to be able to do everything, you can decide that you're going to go to the gym, buy groceries, mow the lawn, get a haircut, pick up the dry cleaning, and this is the, the order of consequence, <laughs> the order of things that these apps allow you to tailor your life to achieve. But in the book, I describe this kind of rearranging of work in terms of a, a kind of aesthetics. You know, it's, it's a way of making your workload look nicer <laughs> and look like you're in control of it. Um, and one of the reasons that is attractive to us now is that we're working in jobs where increasingly the output of our work is immaterial. It is very hard for us to show how we've ever completed anything 
when we work in jobs that are symbolic, that are about information and data processing, and there's never really any end to the work. Um, in relation to my previous research, this is an extension of that idea of work's intimacy, where what's personal and what's pro professional obligation is blurry, and the ways in which people orchestrate their lives to be able to put this labour in some kind of um, regime that's, that seems ordered and seems measurable and seems controllable is, is one, of their, um, one of their great fantasies and, and why they're so popular, I think. But these two are not new and they relate to different ideas of time management that have been very popular in business and, and other kinds of self-help that um, if you ever need to go into business, um, you, might, you might read things like The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which gives you this roadmap for how you should designate what things are important in your day and how you should pay um, the right amount of attention to them. A lot of the productivity tools that are digital now inherit this idea that if you just prioritise things in the right order, uh, then you'll have this reserve of efficiency <laughs> um, magically available to you. So, so learning the right literacy um, to understand what is an important thing and worth your time and what is something that you should be delegating to others is, is really the legacy of, of these ideas of time management. I'm going to skip over this and just conclude with some of the... Um, more worrying aspects, I suppose, of productivity apps as they're designed today. Um, in the book, I talk about the, uh, the fantasy of time management as being dependent on an idea of delegation. That there will be always somebody there to take care of the work that you don't want to do. Um, and in this app, which is called Human, um, the app promises to remember all the things in your calendar and in your interactions with other people that you might otherwise forget. Um, so it will remember the people that you met at an important party that you may have forgotten because, I don't know, you weren't paying enough attention at the time. And it will correct those aspects um, of your memory and judgment that the, the sheer amount of information that you're processing um, often makes you vulnerable to. So it's interesting that these are seen as some of the anxieties that technology can solve for us today. Um, and it's also interesting that there is a need for these uh, in this moment in history. But again, like I've been saying all along in this talk, um, there are precedents for this kind of technology too. Um, the first ever self-help book I found in my research was, uh, was published in its ninth edition in 1911. And how to systematise the day's work published by the System Company, love that name, um, has this wonderful theory of having a system to take care of your work for you. And it says, your brain has a capacity limit. Don't overload it. Don't fill it with details. Don't burden it with worry. Get a system. And this is really the high moment of thinking that you can organise your life if you just apply the right technique to capture all of the information that's coming to you and systematise it. And the, and the great fantasy of these systems is that the system will remember all that it should not forget and forget all that it should not remember. And I think this is one of the ways that we like to think technology can help us in our lives, in the way that we capture information and also bracket out those irrelevant details or those things that don't count for present purposes. And that's really um, the lesson I wanted to leave you with today is the decisions we make about methods, about the systems we apply to make sense of the world, um, they're always a judgment of what counts, what counts as meaningful data. Um, what often gets left out are some of those social questions that I've been referring to um, the power dynamics involved in generating any kind of activity, um, the forms of surveillance or ethics or consent that are involved in taking somebody's experience as representative. And there's always a tendency, I think, especially in, in universities or other places of knowledge, to perform knowledge and science and credibility in a way that we have to be careful of. Um, because on reflection, 
in history, we've seen the terms of engagement and judgment change as, as how we accept what is um, appropriate and, and what is representative of, well, in my case, um, the study of work and labour. So um, my final thought really is to say um, we're here to talk about digital methods and new technologies, but it's important not to put too much faith in technology to make visible what we can't see, um, because often those things we can't capture through devices may be the most important. Thank you. No pressure, then. <laughs> so maybe I'll ah, uh, Hi, uh, Dr. Greg. Uh, this is Chris from uh, our school. I'm also a PhD student here. And uh, uh, really, thank you for your awesome presentation. So actually, I have a lot of questions. But considering the time issue, I would like to ask some questions that I think are most important. Because at the very beginning, you were talking about uh, the time management of the assembly line and uh, from a more uh, industrial uh, uh, perspective. And uh, I could understand as a collective management of the employees in, the, in such a company situation. So, and later on, you talk about the apps, the use of apps, which is a more individualized uh, use of time management. So I would like to know more like how these two different kind of settings could um, help us understand the, the, the mutual reshaping uh, of uh, technology and the time. Yes. Uh, and also, the second question is uh, it's about the uh, uh, motivational use of uh, technology to manage the time issue. Because uh, I, I recently read a book uh, called uh, the, the the price for time, which is talking about the time pressure paradox, and uh, I so know this one. <laughs> oh yeah, this is a really good book. So I would like to know more like uh, how we really understanding the motivational theory, uh, like how those are those uh, uh, more uh, some new motivations could Im uh, urge motivate us to use uh, uh, logistics apps or time 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 use apps. Mm -hmm. So uh, instead of those UNG. Uh, theory we have you know study a lot in the media mm -hmm. uh, studies, so hope you understand my questions. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Um, you're letting me explain a little more in that first uh, question about the relationship between management thinking and design for technology, and and that's really the basis of this project for me. Now that I work in a technology company, and I hear. Uh, the way that people design technology in sharing the language of management. Um, the, the, the term productivity is the, the main objective of both management theory and technology design, especially technology design for business use. Um, they use the same word, and that's not accidental. And the, the, the project I'm trying to uh, draw out is the way in which uh, engineering as a discipline facilitated that convergence. Um, so the reason I focus on technology and apps today is because I th think they take for granted an idea of ordering time and this idea of uh, controlling time, which is a very distinct and culturally specific view of how time actually feels and how it works. And it, it does create the idea that you can control and manage time in a way that the, the second question pressed for time talks about in that book as time sovereignty. That you as an individual can control your experience and your interactions in a way that's going to be um, satisfying and remove any uh, unpredictability. So I say that the idea of command and control and time sovereignty are uh, hand in hand in the engineer's imagination and this has found an audience in management thinking and in technology. Um, 
the, the trouble that poses is that it doesn't account, and this is again where press for time is very good, it doesn't account for multiplicity. It doesn't account for the fact that you can be doing more than one thing at a time. And in fact, the experience of labor for many people, but particularly women and other minorities, has been that you have to do many things at once. <laughs> because a lot of the things that you have been doing weren't counted as labor, doesn't matter. Um, I could answer more, but I feel like there was a lot in that. <laughs> Happy to talk more afterwards. OK. Yes, a second question? Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I'm JD, a researcher from Shanghai. I kind of have a question about um, kind of maybe generational views of like productivity and efficiency because a lot of the management thinking is very much like maybe for me it feels like previous generation is about like how to do how to do more, just like how to do more in the time that you're given. But then I think especially with like this generation is about how to do more in a compressed uh, frame of time so that you can have more time for yourself, hence like four hour work week and, and things like that. So in terms of like uh, when you're looking at technology and apps and productivity, like to what extent do you see this kind of like new line of thinking about how we should use our time inside and outside of work and balancing this? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that? I have or? many thoughts on that. Thank you for asking. Um, two things I'll say um, to try and shorten what I would love to talk to you a lot about. Uh, I think the, the broader point I make in the book is that the idea of time management suited the interests of the organization. Uh, that moment of uh, the experience of work that was bound by offices and factories and physical location. So the idea of time management and information storage and retrieval and all of the metaphors that we have for thinking about um, keeping control of, of information and data in locations is, is now, it's over. Mobile technology has changed that for good. What I, what I kind of worry about, though, is that um, there have been some historical and economic circumstances that have uh, affected this generation, particularly this recent generation of graduates, in that it's, it's, it may be the case that a four-hour work week sounds good, <laughs> but uh, there are a whole lot of people who have never had the experience of stability that organization life actually did promise for a certain generation for some time. I have, a th I have a theory that we are going to be nostalgic for the organization soon because the precarity that has come with th the dissolution of the welfare state, uh, in, in a, certainly in the European and, and American context, and in the predictable forms of work and temporality that were key to labor politics, when, when you don't have a shared experience of work, and if you're spending all of your time trying to get out of the office and only work for four hours, you're delegating the responsibility for your performance to other people. And, and part of my concern in this research has been just how much uh, the responsibility for collegiality and, and any sense of fellow workers, co-workers, comrades even, <laughs> uh, is completely obliterated by this idea of individualized productivity. So as much as I would like to encourage everybody to have a four hour work week, mm -hmm. I would like you to do that collectively. Um, and not, as is the case with a lot of these apps, by removing yourself from social relations in order to have that as a kind of entitlement and a performance of status, with, which is actually what happens with a lot of these engineers. So I will leave that thought with you.